15. I'm used to the 50-minute sessions. <laughs> hour in, hour out. But of late, I've had to learn how to do a 15-minute session because that's the radio slot for in therapy. But therapy isn't really about talking. It's called a talking cure, but it's as much the listening cure. The therapist is listening, and we don't have an hourglass, you know? We just kind of know what 50 minutes is. The therapist is listening to the patient, the person who comes to see them. There's no good word, whether they're patient, client, and alisand, all those words are kind of not quite right. And as she listens, so the person feels heard. And once they feel heard by another, they can hear themselves. And they can hear things that surprise them. They can hear where they stumble, where they choke, where they don't expect to be upset. They can hear where they're angry. They can hear the silences. They can hear where the words won't come. Of course, the therapist isn't just listening. The therapist is watching. The therapist is observing. The therapist is looking. And the therapist is feeling. And in order to be really available and helpful to what so hurts the individual, to, to, to find a way to reach them, the therapist has to do this kind of magic trick which is she or he has to surrender themselves in the therapy room and enter into the hurt, the heart, the body, the longings, the desires, the conflicts of the other and feel them in a version of how they feel them. And then she has to pull herself back or simultaneously probably divide herself so that she can reflect and can think about what the problem is and how she or he might be of help. Therapy's been shrouded in mystery and therapy's been represented as caricature. We're either Svengali's or we interpret there's no such thing as a cigar. Or we're rendered as frauds. We're just snake oil salespeople. But there's something else about therapy that really interested me when I was a beginner, which is that when I went to a party and I said to people that I was a therapist, they always assumed I could see through them. So, I decided to say that actually I was a geographer because I was actually just at a party. And therapists don't go around interpreting the world from a therapeutic lens. They do that in their office. And one of Freud's great discoveries was not what he had to say about the Oedipus complex or the fact that we all marry our mothers women too, but what he developed was something called the analytic hour, and it was his lab for understanding human subjective experience. By putting a frame around a particular kind of conversation, and by disengaging from many of the conventions of ordinary conversation by lending an ear and allowing space to happen around words. 
one could see the workings and the painful and difficult workings of the human mind. So it's in the analytic session, it's in the consulting room that I try to understand what happens and what's gone so wrong for the people that I'm working with. Now, it's a very, very odd conversation. We don't ask questions. I mean, we ask a few. We don't soothe people by reassuring them. You know, when they say, I've just come back from my mum's and it was absolutely terrible. We don't say, yeah, it was terrible for me too. This is what happened. What we do is listen. And by leaving some space around the utterances of the person who's come to see us, the conversation goes to places that aren't really touched by ordinary social intercourse. In fact, what goes on in the consulting room is really quite bonkers. And if you were to listen to it unedited, you might really be thinking that shrinks are crazy. But it gives rise to a very special kind of conversation and a very special kind of human activity, which is curiosity. Because one, both people are getting curious about the mind of the other, the body of the other, the passions of the other, the conflicts of the other, as they're in the process of change. And that's a very unusual thing to be doing. And many, of course, like the people at the party that I had to tell I was a geographer, many are curious about what goes on in the consulting room, and they really want to know. And I've tried it through the years in many different ways to talk about what goes on there. And eventually I made a series of programs, or two series of programs, for Radio 4 called In Therapy. Now, the problem is that people have a fetish about... It's no, I should withdraw that. People are very concerned about privacy and about the confidential nature of therapy. It's what makes part of it possible. And when therapists write books and tell about patients, they have to conceal them or disguise them. And in this disguising, they actually miss an awful lot of what they were trying to say. So Philip Roth writes furiously about reading about himself being transposed into an Italian painter. And he says, what's that got to do with being a New Jersey Jewish writer? The, the facts, if they change, they change the tenor. So I've always had problems with writing, unless I was just writing a little vignette. And once I wrote a book called The Impossibility of Sex, which is a series of stories, imagined stories, about therapy, but told from the therapist's perspective. So I was writing about the craft and the thinking behind the therapist's interventions. And it's really a story of what it means to be a therapist. And out of that, I got approached to make a series for the BBC. And I was stuck again with how do I deal with the problem of confidentiality. The solution that I came up with was to bring in the theatre director, Ian Rickson, who I've worked with a lot. He and I have, I've been into his rehearsal studios many times to discuss characters with the actors. So I thought if he could bring some actors in, the kind of actors who really know how to improvise, and if he could choose actors that none of us would recognize, because even though they're very accomplished, they're not necessarily household names, and if they could be briefed to develop a character, we would then record a series of sessions and see what happened. So I would say, I'd like to uh, give me somebody who's going through a story of loss, of 
immigration, emigration. That was all I would say. And Ian and the producer would go away and work with the actor, to, and the actor would develop a backstory about somebody with loss who had an immigration and emigration story. I didn't really know anything about them. And then right before the session, I would be, as they were, which was all done in my consulting room, I would be um, briefed as the actor was being mic'd in downstairs. I would be told, you've been seeing this person for six months, uh, they come weekly, and um, that's it. Okay, There's, there is, they, they fulfilled the right to, to do an immigration. So I had to pretend I knew the person. So it was a kind of high wire act. I had absolutely no idea what was coming at me. Or I'd say, um, give me a 64-year-old retired trade unionist with two failed marriages who I've been seeing in... No, I didn't even specify how long I'd been seeing him. So Peter White came in and played John, and I've had him um, in three of the sessions, if you followed them. And the first one... I was absolutely flabbergasted to discover that he'd fallen in love with me. Why I should be flabbergasted, I don't know, because that is part of, Freud wrote a lot about transference love, the, 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 the capacity or the inevitability of people falling in love with their therapists and how that's a kind of distraction from the therapy that you have to get beyond or you have to take up. I don't look at it that way, but I do look at it as a very useful thing. So I was just thrown into that experience. I had a, a somebody who came for a first session, but who um, caused a lot of mayhem and responding to that. So it was, in a way, the making of the series was a bit like therapy, because you are plunged into the middle of somebody's life story. You don't really know why you're, what you're listening for at the beginning, but you are always trying to meet them and find out what's why are they getting in the way of themselves? What makes life so very, very difficult for them? So we'd record a session for about 20 or 25 minutes. And because we only had a slot for 15, we would then have to cut the slot. So I would listen patiently to the session and say, well, I, I'd like to cut here and I'd like to cut there and this, that and the other. Kevin would do a very rough cut of the first uh, to get rid of some of the stuff that didn't work at all. But what I discovered was, well, it was a very interesting process. I really discovered, and I thought this was very brave of my producer, how much quiet there is in a therapy session, how few words are often said. I know it's pretty quiet, but I wasn't quite sure how quiet. But I also noticed that I had certain ticks, like I would say at the end of certain sentences, isn't it? Which really offended me, but I couldn't take them out because my voice didn't land in the right place without them. And obviously you don't have to do that as a therapist because your voice just lands where it lands. So the sessions were very much in the raw and they were very, very authentic to the situation. And I wanted to show the democracy of the session, that it's as led by the person who's coming. It's much more led than by the old-fashioned authoritarian view of the therapist, of the, the analyst. I think why the programs have been interesting to people is that in listening into in therapy, it lets us into the mind of the other. And like literature, it tells us about that most enduring of subjects, ourselves. Thank you. Thank you.